second we're live. Okay, zoom is it for us? <laughs> Thank God. Okay, so um <clears throat> uh so there are reasons why it's taken a couple thousand years for Mashiach to come. Uh, there's impediments, spiritual impediments put, put in place by the generations of the destruction of the temple, and um, there are ways to remove those. But there's actually a, a um, un, under the circumstances of our generation, there's a convenient way to um, to help bring Mashiach sooner than in previous generations. So I wanted to point that out. I haven't heard it discussed anywhere. All right, so first uh, let's go and quote from the Gemara in Tainus. That's uh, uh, Gemara Tainus um, 30b. Whoever uh, is mourns over Jerusalem's destruction, they will merit and to to see in its joy. And whoever doesn't uh, uh, mourn in, in uh, on, over Jerusalem will not uh, see in its joy. So usually, Jerusalem means Jerusalem, but often in in a spiritual spiritual context, Jerusalem means the holy temple. Uh, so if the um, holy temple is in ruins, even if there's beautiful skyscrapers as there are today, it doesn't mean Jerusalem has been rebuilt from a, a spiritual perspective. Without the holy temple, the blessings that come to the world through Jerusalem being rebuilt, guaranteed world peace, no more terrorism, etc., uh, those are not active until the uh, the temple is rebuilt. But the temple has to be rebuilt according to the Torah ways. If if you know temple history, um, there are a couple times, like uh, during uh, the uh, evil king of Judah, um, King Manasseh, they they they, um, they interfered with the um, the temple orthodoxy of that day, and then uh, you know the, the uh, Syrian Greeks interfered with the temple service, and and you know the story from Hanukkah. And during the second temple period. So without the temple being um, according to the rules of the uh, Torah of Moses, uh, so therefore it becomes a, a, a ineffective to create the spiritual blessing to the world. So therefore we not only need it rebuilt, we need it rebuilt in a kosher way. So there's two rabbinical um, holidays in the Jewish calendar that help rebuild the uh, temple the most, help end the exile the most. Uh, and now now any um, anyone but Moses who gives a commandment, uh, even if it's another prophet, that commandment is considered by, by Talmudic law as rabbinical. It's, um, it's more lenient usually, but uh, if you want to follow it, you have to follow strict guidelines. So, th those two, those two command, uh, two uh, holidays like that is a Purim and uh, Tisha B'av, the the fast of Av. Hanukkah is also a rabbinical uh, decree, but Hanukkah was decreed after the times of the prophets. Purim and Tisha B'av were both decreed by by prophets and uh, ratified by the. Uh, Sanhedrin of the, um, of course, a prophet in in certain uh, in certain ways is like a Sanhedrin, but to establish custom for for uh, perpetual uh, usage, there has to be also the Sanhedrin vow. Okay, so um, now. Uh, it's it's um, so strict that God defends God defends these uh, these rabbinical holidays of Purim and Tishbev. Again, they were given through prophets, but not Moses. Nevertheless, they're clear, clearly the divine will. So the same uh, page of, of the Gemara Tainus says 
Um, whoever does um, casual work on, on the fast of Av will not see a bless uh, a sign of blessing for eternity. For eternity. So now that that's potentially scary. I mean, how far does that go? Is it a curse? Uh, what what does that mean? So fortunately, the great sages are, are uh, also comment on these things. And if you look in Tosvos, the first Tosvos on that page, you'll find that it refers to that category of um, forbidden labor. For example, if someone if someone were to um, uh, to um, you know just to decide to uh, mow their lawn or something, so. Uh, it's it's inappropriate to, to spend the a a a morning fast day uh, t tending to your lawn. So then people could, so, could suddenly start to have uh, problems with weeds in in that lawn, even if they never had weeds uh, before. And then they may find that um, that the uh, the uh, weed killer that bite is ineffective. So it's a, a continuing process of of kind of like a curse on the work they did because and, and it was the work of their hands that they, they chose to uh, violate the the fast day in that way okay uh um, russell can i check in sound check can you still hear me there is another a loud uh, noise behind me no you sound very good for us rabbi okay thank you uh well as long as we're paused for a second um just wanted to deliver some good news about uh, uh, that uh, the doctor gave a very, very favorable prognosis for me. Right. All right. Um, he expects a uh, complete recovery, thank God. Baruch Hashem. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So, all right, that's the Gemara in Tainus. All right, so let me consult my notes. Okay, so there were there were two destructions of the temples that we both um, commemorate on Tishva festival. Technically speaking, the destruction of the the second temple occurred on the tenth of us, but it began on Tishba. And the, the the first temple it began on the seventh of us, uh, today and is the uh, seventh of us where we're recording from. Uh, so for two days the Babylonians uh, uh, had um, apparently uh, wild orgies in the holy temple to the the filets. And um, and um, and then when the Romans had their their shot at it, they they um, uh, they uh, practiced idolatry in the holy temple. Uh, so, and in, in both cases, uh, the 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 invaders were attacking the um, the uh, the the holy priests of Israel. Uh, so. Uh, so now each one had a different um, cause. The the sins that led to the destruction of the first temple were were, were uh, idolatry, um, bloodshed, and immorality on the part of uh, large segments of the uh, the Hebrew people, and the the imperative for God to destroy His own house. Um, was that uh, in that generation there was Baal worship, human sacrifice. Oh boy! Uh, mm. So, and but we we find in in uh, the book of Ezekiel, mm. which uh, can, went from the time of the destruction till the uh, exile in Babylon, so that um, God found a way to end. Uh, the Hebrew involvement in in uh, Baal worship forever. So God's plan was uh, destroy the temple, and then have Ezekiel and Daniel 
already in, in Babylon waiting to, to give a spiritual guidance to the next generation. And they were effective in uh, bringing the people back. And in the, the generation of Ezekiel, uh, Baal worship was eliminated from, from Israel only because God allowed his holy temple to be, to be destroyed. So we see that the way God is served is more important to him than having fancy service. He, God's not into um, external signs of, of uh, honor uh, alone. The main thing is that uh, there has to be real service. And uh, the most, to God, the most dis disgusting form of idolatry was that which included bloodshed. Okay, I'm going to quote from Jeremiah chapter 19. So in chapter 19, verses 4 and 5, God explains why he was abandoning uh, Jerusalem and the temple. Because they forsook me and estranged this place from me, and they burnt incense in it to the gods of others that they had not known, they and their forefathers and the kings of Judah, and they filled this place with the blood of innocent people, and they built the high places of the Baal, <clears throat> at which to burn their sons in fire as burnt offerings to the Baal, which I never commanded, nor spoke of, nor even considered in my heart. Consider these words, which I never commanded, nor spoke of, nor even considered in my heart. It is so far removed from godliness, God would, wouldn't even contemplate it, and wouldn't even think to ask of it, of, of anyone. Uh, so it's the Baal worship was the antithesis of the service of God, and the, the Hebrews are trying to. Uh, many Hebrews in that generation were 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 steeped in it. So God's priority was to remove it from the Hebrews. And then um, uh, the uh, in the. In the second temple area era, the um, temple was destroyed from disunity, strife, uh, slander, uh, and th these sort of things among uh, the, the Jewish people in in the time of the Romans. Uh, so now, when when we read, for example, Lamentations, it's focusing primarily on the first destruction. A lot of our problems nowadays are primarily from the second destruction. However, the first, the second temple was built really supposed to be what we, is going to become the third temple. But when during the rebuilding of the temple, in the days of Ezra, only about um, between ten and twenty-five percent of the people uh, came to the Holy Land to rebuild God's temple, and um, there has to be at least a majority, as it says in the Talmud, um, Perkyabos, after the ethics of the fathers, Hakolifi Rov Hamaya said, everything's according to the majority of the uh, of the action. So, since a majority of the people chose to stay in the exile, so therefore the the full holiness of the first temple never really came to the second temple. So this, uh, and it was informed. Uh, to Zerubbabel, who was the um, Davidic uh, candidate of that generation, uh, by the prophet Haggai, that he he told him that um, he, both he and his son would not be eligible to become Mashiach because the the people were not ready to move back. So therefore, it's not just 
the the sins that destroyed the second temple that we the current exile is from it is from the fact that even after they repented from from the Baal worship the generation of the of the uh, exile of babylon uh, did not fully return to jerusalem to have the holy temple thus we find it in the uh, medrash shmuel that uh, Israel has to repent for three things that they rejected. They rejected the Ol Mal the the um, the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. The they rejected base David to to uh, to revere and have as their main leaders the the house of David. And um, they rejected the holy temple. So the the words of the Medrash are understood in this context. Because since they didn't do what would be necessary to rebuild the temple with the full holiness, so therefore they were rejecting the whole, the temple. Remember, without holiness, so then God doesn't want the temple, right? And and when with, with Baal worship was involved, he he allowed the uh, Babylonians to destroy it. Uh, so therefore, there has to be holiness involved uh, for the temple to be the temple. Okay, so a holy temple is what we're trying to rebuild, not just a temple. Just rebuilding a temple is led to the second temple, which, which in a sense, led to our, our current exile. It did not uh, give the eternal salvation that God promised. Okay, so now there's a fascinating story in the Gomorrah Sanhedrin where God... Uh, God's, um, it's it's amazing. So, first of all, let's understand uh, that uh, Mashiach, uh, the Jewish Messiah, is a, just a regular human king, uh, but he has an extra soul. So th there's a messianic soul, which um, will go upon the person that God wants to be Mashiach. We find a similar discussion of a multiple multiple souls in the concept of the Sabbath. That there's a special Sabbath soul that rests upon uh, a Jew who, who fulfills the uh, commandments of the Sabbath. Similarly, there's a special Mashiach soul, just like the special Sabbath soul, that rests upon uh, the, the the human in the end of days who becomes eligible for to house that soul. Okay, so there's a fascinating uh, uh, anecdote in the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin where Elijah the prophet went and visited the soul of Mashiach and uh, went, the uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi went with him. Okay, so this is page 98A in the Gomorrah and Sanhedrin, towards the bottom, but in the Arab scroll, this would be on page 98A5. A third teaching from Rabbi Shua ben Levi. Rabbi Shua ben Levi met the prophet Elijah, was standing at the entrance of the cave of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. Rabbi Shur ben Levi asked Elijah, will I enter the world to come? Elijah answered him, if, if this Lord wishes it. So um, Rashi explains the Shekhinah, the, the divine presence, uh, was with them. Shekhinah is not God. It is the interface between our world and God's world. But um, it is the holiest um, manifestation in this uh, universe. So therefore, you know, it's, it's divine presence is an appropriate uh, uh, descriptor. Uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi said, I saw two people, but I heard the voice of three. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi asked Elijah, when will the Messiah come? 
Elijah answered him, go and ask the Messiah himself. So when you hang out with Elio and Abi, uh, there are certain side benefits uh, and spiritual opportunities that may occur. Rabbi Shua ben Levi asked, where is he sitting? Uh, so Elijah responded at the gate of the city. Elio and uh, Rabbi Shua ben Levi asked, what is his distinguishing feature? So uh, Elijah responded, he is sitting among paupers afflicted with disease. When people need mercy, he's there. He's not dis disgusted by somebody's suffering. Uh, all of them untie and tie all their bandages at the same time, but he untie and ties his bandages one by one. Commentary says, uh, so that he will, so the Messiah will be ready to leave at any moment um he completes each task first instead of just like for example uh taking off the dirty bandages of three patients and then putting on clean bandages of three patients he f f fully completes each patient he was helping uh, one by one so that he's ready to immediately leave And the Gemara continues, for he says, I might be needed at any moment, therefore I will deal uh, deal with my bandages this way so I will not be delayed. Now, Bishop ben Levi went to uh, Mashiach, Messiah, it's again referring to the soul of Mashiach because Mashiach wasn't born yet in, the, in that generation. Uh, this anecdote occurred in approximately in the second century of the Common Era. Amar Lay, so Rabbi Shua ben Levi said to, to Mashiach Sol, uh, a peace upon you, my, my master and teacher. The Messiah said to Rabbi Shua ben Levi, peace upon you, son of Levi. Uh, Rabbi Shua ben Levi asked him, when is the master coming? Mashiach answered him, today. Rabbi Shua ben Levi went back to uh, Elijah. Elijah asked him, what did he say to you? Rabbi Shua ben Levi answered Elijah, Peace upon you, son of, son of Levi. Uh, Elijah, uh, Elijah said to Rabbi Shua ben Levi, He has assured you and your father are both destined to enter the world to come. Rabbi Shua ben Levi then said to Leo, uh, But he lied to me, for he said to me, I am coming today, and he has not come. Uh, Elijah said to Rabbi Shua ben Levi, this is what he meant he was saying to you. Today, if you heed his voice, God's voice. Hayom in Today, if you heed God's voice. Okay. So, today, if we heed God's, God's voice. So, how do we hear God's voice? So also in the Gemara Sanhedrin, same chapter, chapter 11, uh, on the preceding page, there's another foundational uh, discussion. Uh, so this is page, towards the end of 97b, uh, in the arts world, this would be 97b4. Amar Rav, Rav said, uh, all the ends have passed. In other words, the end times when Mashiach should come. And the matter of the Messiah's arrival depends only on repentance and good deeds. Now, this is different. This is different from, from the uh, concept of the end of days, Acharis Yamim. There is a case set up for Acharis Yamim. But... Um, uh, Rob is saying that even though there there is a backup plan that in the end of days Michelle will come even if people haven't repented we could simply repent and do good deeds and Michelle will come instantly so so you know we shouldn't overemphasize the fact that there is a um 
uh, that uh, there, there is an end of dates where, where God will automatically bring Mashiach because then we won't be doing the mitzvahs necessary to bring Mashiach. But Shmuel says it is enough for the mourner to endure his period of mourning. So Shmuel says that, um, you know, it, it may be hard to expect the people, in other words, this is my my understanding of it. It may be hard for to expect the people in the time of exile dispersed and um, under uh, influences uh, to, to uh, maybe go farther away from the Torah. It's difficult to expect them to repent. Uh, but but the, the time of their exile will bring about the, the necessary equivalent of repentance. And that's enough for God. So whether it's repentance or suffering, the people will be forgiven. And what Shmuel is saying is consistent with the Gomorrah in Brachos uh, 5a, uh, where where it says, you certain my marking call of on of shaladam. Uh troubles uh wipe clean all the sins of a human. So the Gomorrah in 197b continues. Kitanoi, this is a Parallel to a dispute among the the uh, Tanaim, the sages of the Mishnah, the, between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua. Rabbi Eliezer uh, says, um, if Israel does tshuva, they will be repent. They will be redeemed. Im Israel osin tshuva nigalim, vim lav ein nigalim. But if Israel does not uh, repent, they will not be redeemed. Okay, so according to Shmuel, this this is not this is not uh, it's not necessary. So therefore, he, he, the the discussion of Rav's position is that um, depends depending only on repentance and good deeds. Means um, well. Now it's depending on repentance and good deeds, so there has to be repentance and good deeds. But uh, Shmuel, in 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 the other conversation, uh, pointed out that there is a deadline. It's, it's not unlimited that there there would be repentance and good deeds. There is an end of days. Again, uh, according to Tanakh and Talmud, end of days is not the destruction of the world, uh, cataclysm. End of days is when, the end of days where evil may reign. The beginning of world peace, the prophecies of the wolf and the lamb are in peace, etc. You know, so we see clearly in Isaiah that God wants the world to be uh, continue civilized and, and in peace. That's not possible if, uh, if uh, most of the world's population is dying over and over, you know. So Cataclysm is not God's goal. Uh, so Rabbi Shua said to Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer, if they do not repent, they will not be redeemed. Rather, the Holy One, blessed be he, will appoint a king over them whose decrees will be as harsh as those of Haman, Haman, from the Book of Esther, a Quorum story. And the Jewish people will repent. And in this way, God will bring them back to the right path. So they they will be redeemed. Uh, that will not be redeemed. It was not rejected by Rabbi Yeshua. But he's saying that, but it's not like the, the, the interpretation of Rav where where if they don't repent, they're, 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 um, they're stuck in exile. It's that if if they must be redeemed through repentance, then God will make it happen whether or not they want it. But but Shmuel, Shmuel's opinion, and again, the, the conversation with Robin Shmuel was in a later generation. Uh, so Shmuel's opinion was that, um, no, just by the end of days, that's enough, even if there's no repentance. So Shmuel's view is a is, uh, is a source of comfort because even now, you know, so close to the end of days, we, we still, uh, you know, have a majority of the Jewish people not yet religious. Now, 
many Jews are traditional. They, they for example, may um, honor the Sabbath, but whether or not they, they avoid violating the Sabbath uh, is a separate thing. You do have a, a um, solid minority who are keeping all the laws of the Torah in the uh, Orthodox community. But we're talking about, how, remember, the concept we talked about, how Kolofi Robamasa, everything's according to the majority of the uh, action. And again, the prophecy of Haggai, that without a majority of the people, uh, you can't have the Holy Temple uh, as uh, as holy as it was in the days of Solomon. Uh, so therefore, we have a situation where um, Shmuel's opinion is a backup if if God forbid people were not fully religious, at least there is a time when God will say, you suffered enough, let's just uh, let me take you back in. But it's interesting to note that Rav Chaim Kanievsky, the, the leading sage of the previous generation, uh, he held according to the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. So according to Rav Chaim Kanievsky, if Israel will repent, they will be redeemed. If they will, if not, they will not be redeemed. Which creates a problem, therefore, that if they're not re repenting, therefore the the clause of Rabbi Yeshua is, must come in, where there would have to be an enemy of Israel who's cruel, who would have power over Israel to an extent, and and the face of, in face of that cruelty, Israel would start repentance. And in this Hebrew year, back on October 7th, we see that um, Hamas was given the ability from heaven to, to um, unexpectedly break through Israel's border and uh, kill 1,200 people in one, in one uh, day and uh, take many hostages. So th this seems to be a, a, the starting of the, the clause of Rabbi Yeshua, where God is bringing about the redemption uh, through an enemy like Haman. But ideally, remember the, the, in the Purim story, no Jews died. So, but in the time of Esther, everybody was observant. Everybody was trying to keep the Sabbath and so forth. So, what can we do to make sure that uh, not just Mashiach comes soon, but that we, Mashiach comes without further cataclysm or, or severe bloodshed? So, again, so in other words, let's combine the, the, the things that we learned in the Gemara and Sanhedrin. There has to be repentance according to the majority opinion. And um, Mashiach said that uh, it could happen today if we listen to God. In, in one day, God can redeem us. And the possibility of terrorism and um, uh, bring about world peace. Okay, so if we're ending terrorism, bring about world peace, it can happen as soon as today. But we're in a cycle where apparently we're being compelled to repent. So if we're being compelled to repent, so it takes a while for people to leave behind, you know, I mean, I mean, for example, you know, if you look at opinion polls about, um, voting for certain candidates who are supporting uh, the Hamas terrorists. Uh, so we see that a percentage of uh, of Jews uh, in very liberal areas, according to one poll, 20% of liberal Jews who, who would have voted uh, uh, for a Democrat are, are refusing to vote for Democrats now because of the what was happening on the, the uh, college campuses supporting uh, the bloodshed of the innocent uh, Israelis and um, uh, persecuting the Jews trying to go to their classrooms in, in America. 
so that that is a change of attitudes and it's 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 taken in some cases a few months for it to occur but that's an example of a forced repentance where okay people have repented they have a different frame of mind but um they didn't choose it willingly it had to be illustrated to them in a harsh way all right so now again let, there's a way we could do this with less suffering so let, let's discuss that aspect of it get willing let me uh let me just hydrate a bit Okay, so in the early 1980s, uh, no, uh, the, the singer Mordechai ben David had a song, um, Just One Shabbos. It, it went, the lyrics went, Just One Shabbos and we'll all be free. Just one Shabbos, come and join with me. Uh, so it, refer, it was referring to the Talmudic uh, concept that one more Sabbath observance of perfection, a perfect, perfectly observed Sabbath, Will bring um, will bring the redemption immediately. So one day of repentance, instant, instant uh, redemption. So this this is a, the greatest parallel in in the Talmud between the statement of, by Mashiach Sol and the um, mechanics of bringing Mashiach in one day, the Sabbath. Okay, so in the Gemara in uh, Jerusalem Talmud, ta um, Jerusalem Talmud, so in the Jerusalem Talmud, um, Tanis, uh, first chapter, I believe, it, it discusses this um, just one Shabbos and, and redemption can come by observing one Sabbath. But in the Medrash Rabbah on Shemos Exodus, it explains this concept, and it also gives a reason why. So, uh, with what energy I have left <laughs> for the class, uh, let's try to focus just on this concept, because uh, let's see how how it can work. That just doing one mitzvah uh, can can end suffering in a single day. This is the first volume of the uh, Arsville Medrash Rabbah on uh, Shemos Exodus. Okay. <clears throat> this is in Parsha Chafei that in the art school, that would be on page. Uh, so that's chapter 25, page 12, starting from page 12, too. From Amr Rabbi Levi. Rabbi Levi said, if the people of Israel would observe the Sabbath properly, even for one Sabbath day, the skin of David, the Messiah, would come. Why? Because it's equal to all the other commandments in importance. So it's not just that you're doing one commandment, but it's also equal to all the commandments in importance. But let's say you want to let's, let's say you want to look at the commandments. Now, every commandment, obviously, the king gives a commandment, and 
he says it is a, a eternal commandment. Anybody who ignores the commandment, it, it can't be a good thing, right? So now, if you if you count the commandments, and and the Gemara does that for us, six hundred thirteen commandments upon the Jewish people, and um, but you count the the commandments involved with the Sabbath day, include the thirty nine um, malachos, the forbidden labors, and command, commandment to honor the Sabbath, and etc. So you come to just over forty commandments uh, for Sabbath. 613 divided by 40 is less than 12, one twelfth of the commandments of the Torah. So, yes, we have to take this statement of the sages in context. Yes, it's equal to all the other commandments in, in that it's a statement of, uh, the Sabbath is a statement of, I'm dedicated to your law. But it would be a mistake to say if a person keeps the Sabbath, they can get away with ignoring over 12 times many more commandments you understand uh, just imagine listening listening to a king once and then for the next 11 times completely ignoring and disrespecting him it may not go good for such a for such a person right so we have to understand this in context if you're saying this as a life's goal keep only sabbath and then go around and uh uh, do any other evil you want. So that's not a good life goal and it's not a good way to get into heaven. But if you're saying bring Mashiach in one day, so the potency of the Sabbath is equal to the other commandments. You understand? In that context. All right, now th this is a long medrash. It continues on. So now, how exactly does it work, though? Because we're talking, again, we're talking about less than one-twelfth of the number of commandments. Yes, it's a, a statement of, 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 of a dedication to God. But the fact is, if you're talking about somebody, it, you know, again, somebody who's completely observant, the Sabbath day, okay, it's the, the crown on the head, right? It, it, it shows that that observant person is a really observant person because he keeps the Sabbath day holy. But for, again, a person who's actively pursuing uh, evil, according to the Torah, only he also keeps the Sabbath. So then how exactly does that even work for one day, right? You cannot, you know, you could th throw a bone to a, a dog. You can't do that to a person. You certainly can't do it to the king of all kings. Uh, so therefore, we, we have to understand this, that... What is it comparable to, and and um, how does that work? So we first have to understand the way that um, G God's character traits are different than ours, and we also have to look at the way that humans uh, function in this world. So if a human is totally dedicated to one mitzvah, like Sabbath, which has over 40, 40 categories of, of uh, implementation, so doing forty different laws to keep the Sabbath. A person is totally focused on focused on that. They don't have time to do another sin. If they had another sin in mind, they would have to tell their friend, "Okay, let's sin tomorrow because I'm too busy today to to get around to it." You understand? So for that Sabbath day, they are completely observant. They just don't have time to sin. But they're they're still dedicated to a life of sin, technically, technically speaking. They haven't repented. So technically, it's not yet repentance. But God is considering it like repentance. Why? Because of the nature of God. God is merciful. We call him the Avarachim in our prayers, the, the merciful father. So what is it comparable to? That God says, oh, you're keeping the Sabbath? Well, get the grandkids ready. I'll be right over. So God's mercy enables this process to work. That we could do a one Sabbath and, and have instant Mashiach time. No more risk of, of bloodshed. No more no more dangers in the world. Not just for the Jewish people, but for the entire world. So. Okay. Now let's con continue in, in this 
uh, we're going to skip down. This is this is a beautiful uh, 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 paragraph here. Maybe you could uh, read inside yourself later. Okay, so now. Okay, let's um okay. it's it's hard to skip it, but I'm I'm worried about my my strength suddenly, you know, getting interrupted before I could finish class. All right, so it, it's it's it, this is a beautiful matter, I, I recommend it. Try to learn inside. Let's skip down to Rabbi Yochanan said, uh, um Amar Kadosh Baruch Yisrael, the Holy One, blessed be, blessed be He, said to His saying to Israel, although I have established a fixed time for the end of the exile, that, remember as per uh, Shmuel uh, in the uh, Gemara and Sanhedrin, whether the people of Israel repent or not, I will. It will arrive at its scheduled time. Nonetheless, if they repent. For even one day, I will bring the Messianic redemption earlier, not at its scheduled time. See that? The Medrash, Medrash is, is clarifying it, putting it in in, in, plain, in plain Aramaic. <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm putting in plain language that, uh, uh, that uh, yes, there is an end of time, but we could also bring Mashiach. So it's not the, the Gemara and Sanhedrin is not a either or to an ultimate degree it's do this if you can repent if you can if you can't i'll still save you god is merciful but again waiting more years is is difficult so we might as well uh, repent if we have a choice Uh, and just uh, skipping again, as just as, as we find for the repenting for performing all the commandments of the, the scheme of David will come because of complete repentance, all of the mitzvahs fulfilled, uh, he'll come immediately. Uh, since the Sabbath is equal to um, all the mitzvahs, so Meshach would also come. Again, it's only equal to all the mitzvahs because God is merciful. He's extrapolating that if we could push off sin for one day, we could push it off indefinitely. You know, because once once he encourages us and shows us, he still loves us after after uh, all the long exile. So I mean, that's that's a loving father that um, the children sin against him, and and he's almost trying to find a way to blame himself uh, enough to have mercy on them. And oh, God is perfect, so <laughs> that's pretty difficult to try to find a way to blame himself. But um, it's it's like he's trying to do that because uh, he can't. He, he's perfect. Beautiful measures, right? Beautiful measures. Okay, uh, continuing down further. Um. Down to the paragraph where it says, um, the Holy One Blessed is, is He. Amr Alam Kadish Baruch Hu Yisrael. The Holy One Blessed is He said to Israel, If you will merit to observe the Sabbath, I will consider it as if you have observed all the commandments of, in the Torah. But if you desecrate it, I will consider it as if you desecrated all the commandments. Ah, so if a person's a, a saint in, uh, in 11 of the 12 percent of, of the uh, tw uh, you know 11 parts of the Torah but in, in the Sabbath uh, he he violates it willingly therefore God will consider it as if he's completely completely evil okay so it, it uh, now that we learn the power of the Sabbath we have to understand <laughs> remember the Sabbath day keep it holy don't mess with the Sabbath okay so if, if God forbid a person uh was was going to take their time too long to repent 
don't do that with Sabbaths. Make sure you observe Sabbath and then do the other parts of the Torah uh, that uh, it's harder for you uh, later. Except, you know, we're talking about um, do not murder maybe something you want to include in your uh, keeping the Sabbath package <laughs> to start, start uh, right away being uh, observant. Uh, stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now here's a key quote um, be, because the of the commentary on this verse. Uh, so after this, I'll, I'll interrupt our... Con uh, there's more to this medrash, but I recommend you, you finding a way to learn it elsewhere. Uh, let me just quote this verse, and then we'll go to the, the book of Isaiah on this. Uh, similarly, scripture says, Praiseworthy, praiseworthy is one who guards the Sabbath against desecrating it and guards his hand against doing any evil. And then just one more um, aspect of it. Uh, when a person observes a Sabbath, God gives them a spiritual power to make, make a decree and God fulfills it. So in other words, um, maybe, maybe if he's if he's doing a lot of sins, this is not as um, active, but the, the observance of Sabbath will empower um, a Jew to eventually give a, a commandment to a, a, an angel. So, but the, so, um, in other words, there's no impediment to repent to uh, redemption if there is Sabbath. Without Sabbath, it's a problem. Okay, but let's discuss that verse in Isaiah. Yeah. That was Isaiah 56. Uh, let's look at verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 56, verses 1 and 2. Isaiah 56, 1 and 2. Ko amar adonai shimru shimru mishpat vasut sedaka ki krova yeshua si lavo tzitka si lihagalos. Ashri Anush Yasezos Uven Adam Yahazik Ba Shomer Shabbos Michalo Vashomer Yado Mesos Kovra. Thus said Hashem, observe justice and perform righteousness. Uh, uh, for my salvation is soon to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Uh, this is again an, another verse where we find the concepts of Mishpah and Sadaka be, being in uh, a common refrain throughout Tanakh. Uh, so uh, so Mishpah and Sadaka represent all the mitzvahs of the Torah. And then we mentioned in the same context, uh, um, uh, uh, Praiseworthy is a man who does this and the person who rests it tightly, who guards the Sabbath against desecration and guards his hand against doing any evil. Okay, so in, in the Medrash Rabbah, on this verse, the eight Yosef commentary, uh, learns this, this uh, verse a little differently than the Radak. So according to uh, eight Yosef, the, the uh, phrase, uh, and he guards his hand from doing any uh, any evil. Revert, refers to um, violation of Sabbath. So, the violation of Sabbath is the equivalent of any evil possible. So it's very important to keep the Sabbath. But Radak has a different perspective. Sabbath was already covered in the first part. Uh, he who guards the Sabbath from from violating it, but um, guards the guards his hand from doing any evil, 
doesn't just refer to Sabbath, it refers to all of the prohibitions of the Torah. Okay. That's a radak. Okay, so so we see there's more than one way to interpret the, that verse from Isaiah 56, uh, verse 2. So, in other words, there's room for, for another interpretation. Rather than, rather than uh, we, we see that Redux says uh, the, the phrase um, and guards his hand from doing all and any evil refers to something else than just Sabbath. But we see from Eitz Yosef that it refers to one matter, not all the, the prohibitions of the Torah. So let's combine these two concepts. Um, you know, Take half of the uh, perspective of Eitz Yosef and half the perspective of Radak uh, and form it to create an alternative exegesis. And thereby we say, uh, in the verse in Isaiah, Shorva Shavas Michalo Shomer Yado Mesos Kora, so from any evil refers to a single evil that's equivalent to the Sabbath. Because we see Sabbath is equivalent to um to all the sins. So that there's a sin equivalent to violating Sabbath. Okay. So now we're talking about the end of days, right? And and you know, it's the sages have revealed that uh, this is the um, last generation before Mashiach, and st the start of the ma messianic uh, generations. Uh it hasn't come yet, but about to. Okay, so so therefore, what what sin in our generation is equal to violating Sabbath, which is equal to violating the entire Torah? Well, we we saw earlier in the discussion of the temple, right, and and the exile. And we quoted a verse from Jeremiah, and we saw that God's attitude towards idolatry that perverted His temple. He would rather His temple be dashed to pieces than to allow a house dedicated to, to the Baal worship. And in, in Jeremiah 19.5, and they built high places of the Baal the, to burn their sons in fire as burnt offerings to the Baal, which I never commanded nor spoke of, nor even considered in my heart. So that's the antithesis of God is uh, human sacrifice. And the only com comparable sin in our generation to human sacrifice is abortion by women. So therefore, uh, abortion by women, in my opinion, is is equal to violating Sabbath from the perspective of completely destroying a person's spirituality. Um, it, as if murder w wasn't enough uh, of a clue, but Again, because it, there's technically a umbilical cord that's attached to somebody else, therefore it's you know it's a little confusing at times. But we see that the the Baal worship, where the children were dedicated for destruction, is uh, an anathema to, to the uh, Creator. Okay, so now. Okay, so that is my supposition. I haven't proven it. But if let's look at the commandments of Shabbos, right? What is the one halacha, the one law of Sabbath that is the most profound of all the laws of Sabbath? Of course, explicitly, for example, there it's written, don't 
uh, don't kindle fire in your home uh, on the Sabbath day, right? That's explicitly written in the Torah. But the most fundamental law of the Sabbath, uh, well, actually, the most fundamental law of the Sabbath is actually if there's a danger to life, it pushes aside the Sabbath day. Danger to life pushes aside the Sabbath day. Okay, so that means the most fundamental law of Shabbos is preser preservation of life. The most fundamental reality of all abortions is the inevitable destruction of life. So therefore, again, in Chazal's time, in, in the Holy Sages of the Talmud's time, they, they wouldn't write a, 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 a discussion about this. Uh, because who would think there would be a time when people willingly choose to kill their own children? Uh, the, uh, uh, it, 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 historically, and it's recorded in Tanakh, it was only an enemy attacking someone where where the, the child would be killed in the womb of the mother. But, so there's no parallel for that to, to our generation. In our generation, we have a... a um, a, a degraded um, uh, sin that that is, um, you know, one one of the worst sins in, in human history because people are, are willingly choosing it. But the foundation of of Sabbath, just like the foundation of God's holy temple, was to have a place without bloodshed. The foundation of the Sabbath is to have a Sabbath that doesn't risk people's lives. Otherwise, it pushes aside. Doha the Shabbos, you completely push aside the laws of Sabbath. Uh, you're not even allowed to contemplate, how could I violate the Sabbath less so I could open this band-aid differently? Or, you know, but we're, we're talking about a, a threat to life. So how, how can I open this Telfa pad differently to stop the bleeding so I could maybe not tear some letters? I don't want to offend God in any way. We're not allowed to make that calculation. We have to simply do the most efficient means to save the life. Right. So therefore, if one more Sabbath will bring Mashiach, the relenting from abortion will bring Mashiach also. Not only will it bring Mashiach, the relenting from abortion is higher than Sabbath because danger to life pushes aside the Sabbath. So only because of the degradation of our generation. We have a new phenomena you won't find discussed historically among the sages. This is even more powerful to bring Mashiach than keeping the Sabbath. The rejection of abortion, uh, the supporting of those who fight abortion, such as a Jewish Pro-Life Foundation, etc. Uh, the This idea is that uh, any risk to life, you cannot keep the Sabbath. Any risk to life, God doesn't want the temple. Right? This is the creator. He values life. He said explicitly, Deuteronomy 30, choose life. He also said in the same chapter, Deuteronomy 30, that Israel will repent in the end of days. And he also promised in the same chapter, Deuteronomy 30, that he will have mercy, mercy upon the Jewish people. Since the redemption is founded in mercy, and abortion is innately a disregard for the, you know, let's say, say it's being inconsiderate towards the suffering of, of the of of the fetus. Okay. So once we have mercy, then we can have a temple that follows God's laws. Then we could have the temple rebuilt because there's mercy. Once we have mercy and a desire to preserve life, so then you could be observant of the Sabbath. If a person observes the Sabbath, and, and let's say they're a doctor, okay, they're observing the Sabbath, and, and um, uh, some people at the synagogue were cut, you know, and they're, they're, they're dropping like flies. They don't know how to stop the bleeding. 
and he and he says, "No, I'm observing the Sabbath. Do not disturb me. I must pray to the Lord." Okay, so uh, from a Jewish perspective, that is not uh, being observant because there's no more Sabbath. It's the laws are pushed aside until there's no more pikuach nevish, till there's no more danger to life, right? Right. How about that? Okay. Couldn't help. I had to say it. <laughs> Very good. So therefore, if there's no pikuach nefesh, then there is Shabbos. Then there's Beis HaMikdash. And then there's a lot of cute babies. So what's the problem? Right? So, but again, we don't have a, a, a Maimar Chazal to tell you this. But it's just a simple extrapolation. If if the laws of Shabbos simply uh, don't, are non-active, if people if someone's bleeding next to you, so then what is the reward for relenting from an abortion, from encouraging others to, to not abort, from supporting people to either support a poor mother or a, a soon-to-be mother or uh, a orphanage? What what's the reward for those things? All these things, obviously, are equal to the Sabbath in this context, just from the logic of the laws of Shabbos themselves. And we see from the Medrash Rabbah, this, the Sabbath is equal to all the mitzvahs of the Torah in, in the context of God's mercy upon us. And more than Sabbath, having mercy on, on children to not abort them is a more, more proactive mercy than than simply keeping a a Sabbath so you could enjoy yourself and and study more, right? So that, that's a, a great mercy and, and kindness to your soul, but proactive mercy. Because of the degradation in our generation, we have a mitzvah greater than all generations to do, an opportunity, an option, whereby we could bring Mashiach in our generation easier than in any previous generation. Simply. By the opposition to abortion. Now, what's the difference between saving someone else's baby and, um, like, taking medicine? Uh, you know, violating the Sabbath so I, I get medicine and, and save my own life, right? The difference is I save my own life. I'm saving one person, right? If if I'm supporting the fight against abortion. Maybe my donation or or my efforts have helped save five lives, or ten lives, or more. So uh, just do a little math here, right? If if a minority of the people are currently observant, and only a minority of people become pro life, but they become pro life in a way that it has a multiplication factor where they're saving more lives. Uh, through the fight against abortion than they are, uh, you know, then they would have been doing good with Sabbath. With Sabbath, they are keeping themselves on the uh, uh, straight and narrow. With the fight against abortion, maybe they just saved 10 lives. So even if a minority of the people fight against abortion, you have the same math as if the entire nation had repented. You understand? So now, since we're dealing with the Avarachim and the Merciful Father, it seems very likely that uh, this could be the foundation to bring redemption, um, even even uh, great, more easily than than see, observing Sabbath, because it, it may not may not. Uh, again, I don't have a statement from the sages guaranteeing this. You know, the sages had uh, traditions from the prophets. I, I don't know. This is just. Uh, the way God helped me, you know, study this. But the, the idea is this: it's, it seems like it could work that um, even if a minority of the people are observant, um, we could still have Rabbi Eliezer's. If they if they do repentance, uh, they will be redeemed. If they don't, they won't. It could still happen, even according to more strict opinion. At the very least, we're, we're, we would be avoiding having to wait uh, like five more years for, for for the end of days or something, right? We don't have to have five more years of suffering. So 
my advice is just try to go out and encourage people to uh, fight against abortion or, or you know, have a good um, organization like a Jewish Pro-Life Foundation as, as your surrogate to fight, fight for you. Just give a donation at least or encouraging, uh, spread links, st stuff like that. So, um, and if, if, if you can, don't do that, uh, at least encourage the Sabbath. Uh, like Mordechai ben David said, just one more Sabbath and we'll all be free. Okay, so thank God. God uh, has uh, given me a, a little more energy, oh, or much more energy, <laughs> however you want to look at it, uh, than I expected. So uh, I can offer, open the floor to questions from the floor. Okay, Russell? Russell? Yes. Okay, yeah, so... Um, any anyone contacted you with questions? I did. I think, uh, I think uh, Julie, if she's still on here, I think she had some questions that she wanted to bring up. I haven't seen any in text anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, Julie had any questions? I did. Um, so when I, I understand and I fully received what you were saying, <clears throat> saying about abortion and Shabbos. My question is this: So, if the if the if the Bene Noah are not commanded to be fruitful and multiply, and they are not commanded to observe Shabbos, and Shabbos is directly representative of getting rid of idolatry, it's a psychological transformation too, right? So then, how do we reconcile this with ushering in Mashiach? Because I just feel that. Somehow here is a huge part of the puzzle that promoting high, promoting life, promoting the abandonment of that idolatry helps the lower realms. And by extension, does that help the upper realms or is it reverse? Is it that Israel needs to embrace that first and then it trickles down? Like I'm trying, I feel like there's, this is huge, but I exactly. can't, I can't grasp it entirely. Right. Well, God is merciful and everything is according to the way people make choices. So, again, Israel was designed to make choices to and their choices can more easily trigger certain spiritual changes in the world. But uh, they were influenced for 2000 years by, by the nations. So. You know, it's it's known before Hashem. Is it going to come from Israel, or is it going to come somehow from the nations, encouraging Israel to make the right choices? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. But the thing is, this uh, in regards to the laws of abortion, they are even more strict for Gentiles than than for Jews, according to the Torah. There is a leniency for, for a Jewish woman to. Uh, risk the life of her baby to make sure her life is not in danger. Whereas uh, for for a um, uh, Ben Noach, uh, they they have to um, um, they they have the freedom to choose to not risk their, their baby, even if it would be a risk to their own life. By a Jewish woman, she may be forced uh, to allow the doctor to 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 abort the baby because her life would be in too much danger. Whereas a Bas Noach can choose to have birth even if her life would be in danger. But not if it's a, you know, we're not talking about uh, necessarily a, a, a certain death, but we're talking about if, if the doctor's saying they don't know if she's going to survive if they if she keeps the baby. Uh, in many cases, a Jewish woman would be told by a rabbi to have an abortion. Whereas a, a Bas Noach would have the freedom to risk her life for the sake of the baby, so in a, a sense, it's it's another way where 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 Gentiles are given the absolute freedom to pursue a, a, the mitzvah before them. Uh, usually, it's a, a form of kindness, uh, you know, that, that in they they could, um, for example, um, continue to um, deliver um, food for for hungry families. Uh, even as a Jew has to uh, stop uh, and, and get ready for the Sabbath day, the Gentile could continue and make the deliveries. 
But we also have to understand in, in different contexts. For example, a Ger Toshav, and uh, living a Gentile who living in in the Holy Land when Mashiach comes, so they they have to uh, observe certain commandments of the Torah. They, they don't have the same uh, um, uh, unlimited options, uh, relatively speaking, as as uh, Ben Noach nowadays. Also, if somebody had made a vow before a Beth Din, uh, no, it's a debate by by some should they or should they not uh, before Mashiach comes uh, make a vow before Beth Din. But if they did did do a a, a, a vow before the Beth Din, so therefore, uh, then they may be in a situation where they have to observe certain uh, prohibitions of the Torah that normally would not be upon a Gentile. So it, it's a complication, and it's not necessarily a one answer fits everyone but um we do see that with abortion uh, remember Rabbi Moses uh, Feinstein Rabbi Moshe Feinstein he said that a Jewish doctor may not help with the abortion of a Gentile baby even if it would cause uh, uh you know an animosity in other words anti-semitism towards the Jews because they're not helping the Gentile have their their uh uh, abortion. So a Jewish doctor may not uh, abort uh, Gentile babies, which I th I think is a, actually a beautiful law. But right. um, th that the, you know it's it's a very uh, thank God the, the Torah is very merciful. But I, th this is the thing the the, the in ten places God promises this, this is including Isaiah fifty four Zechariah chapter one. And other places as well, that, in Deuteronomy 30, we mentioned, uh, God promises to bring the redemption with mercy. And therefore, if we could do a great mitzvah with mercy, it's a reversal of the, all the process. You understand? So now, it would be great if we bring Mashiach one day and then uh, nobody has to fast on uh, <laughs> Monday night, Tuesday. But um, uh, otherwise, uh, remember the Gmorn Tainus, uh, the one who uh, mourns for Jerusalem will uh, rejoice in it. It's uh, rebuilding. So, um, therefore, it's vitally important to keep uh, the, the fast of Av until, unless and until Mashiach tells us otherwise, right? Even okay. Mashiach comes, uh, you know, if the, if the temple's in ruins, so it's, you know, probably still a fast day. What were you going to say? So, if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. here's where the mercy's coming from. It's not that anybody wants to see a mother die, and it's it's not that anybody wouldn't help another human being. It's more that if you are commanded, then you risk having a guilty verdict. If you are not commanded, then you don't have that. You have a bit of mercy and growth. And so it's better to not command them, but it's not saying it's the equivalent of the choices. You know, it's not that they prefer to see a non-Jewish woman perish, heaven forbid, heaven forbid, or a baby parent. But it's it sounds like it's more of an opportunity of, look, you're going to be judged for this if you're commanded. And that judgment is sweet. And like, if I was to look at it from the right side, from Chesed, mm -hmm. that's what I'm seeing. Is that correct? Or Well, uh, again, we're, we're talking about the... Um... The idea that uh, that people are making choices for the sake of mercy, and what is mercy? So we ha we have to come up with a, perhaps a um, a scenario to uh, as as an example to to understand the the concept better. So in the case of uh, a mother who is told that she, uh, she will her life will be in danger if she doesn't. Um, have an abortion if she's very young and you know everyone in her, in her family's history always gave birth to 20 kids or something uh, just as an, a, a, you know, an extreme example so therefore she knows she will be taking away the possibility of uh, at least a dozen kids being born if she risks her life so that's a different calculation than perhaps somebody who's um you know who's already participated in in um in um, being fruitful and multiply, and 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 uh, now she's she just uh, loves the baby so much, 
she's risking her life for the sake of the baby, uh, not for the sake of, of being fruitful and multiplying because it was already fulfilled. You know what I'm saying? So for the love of a baby, can a person risk their life uh, and not get an abortion if the doctor says their life is in danger if they don't get an abortion, which nowadays is extremely rare. Uh, and so, right. So in such a category, uh, such a categorical uh, case. Uh, so then um, the, a Gentile woman would have an option to choose. Uh, a Jewish woman would have to consult with rabbi and doctor before she can make a choice. If she, if she would even have a choice because uh, a Jewish woman has to, has the, the strict laws of Pukoch uh, Nevish. And it starts from her down. Uh, the again, if the mother died uh, while the baby was in her, and there was no one to take the baby out, the baby would soon die too, right? Mm -hmm. So the mother's life has to come first in such a context. But if if we're about to take out the baby anyway, so yeah, see, so with any gray area, so then uh, then there would have to be more people helping and. The more people help make the decision, the less guilt there is if, if there has to be uh, some sort of a unfortunate uh, situation. Okay, we have a, a, a hand raised, Cecily. Yes, hi, Rabbi. Hi. I just, I'm so grateful to you. It, it was divine serendipity that I tuned in today mm -hmm. and heard this message. It just makes my heart so happy to hear you. Um, with strength in your voice and this wonderful life affirming message that you've carried to your people today. People, I cannot tell you how rare and wonderful this rabbi is, but you probably know it because you're here. Okay, so I just wanted to share that. Um, so I've been studying and working with this issue for since 2006, I started wondering why it was that Jewish people have a propensity to seek uh, termination of pregnancies and talk about it a lot so but it's very interesting that now because we have wonderful uh obgyns who can literally save a mother's life if her life is in danger by what's called preterm delivery mm -hmm. so as rabbi said it's very it's almost unimaginable now that a jewish woman and a rabbi and her doctor would even have to talk about this if the doctor was a life-affirming OBGYN and the rabbi was educated, they would know that these life-threatening situations happen later in pregnancy when a preterm delivery can be very merciful on the baby, first of all, because if the baby is taken out in a dignified way instead of tortured to death, that's a plus. And if the baby is not viable, it can be given like hospice care for babies and allowed to die in peace rather than being torn apart, which was what usually happens in a, an abortion at this stage. And if the baby is viable, it can be saved. Now that's a very merciful thing. I would think Hashem would want us to go in that direction. It's also much more merciful for the mother and the father, because there's always a father involved with this because the parents don't have to live with the guilt that they've tortured their baby to death. They can at least know that they've given it the dignity and mercy that God gives all human life. And so it's a win-win all the way around. So I always talk about preterm delivery now. There's absolutely no reason to torture a baby to death anymore to save the mother's life. And it's much more merciful and safer. Can you imagine a woman with some kind of you know high blood pressure like she's you know she's really really in danger and then you go in there and you start dismembering her baby there's blood all over the place it's extremely dangerous at that point it's much safer to just take that baby in a merciful way and then nobody I, uh, nobody has to feel bad about it yeah in, in that context abortion is, is more dangerous than a natural birth Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. It's very, very traumatizing. There's many women that have terrible complications physically after later term abortions when these problems occur. So, and, but we have an American College of Gynecology that is for abortion. So if you have a, an OBGYN that's for abortion, they're going to say, let's do it. 
But if you have a life affirming OBGYN, they'll say, let's let's take the baby preterm in a safe and dignified way. And then that does not cause more life-threatening problems for the mother. Many people, there are millions of people who do not know how many women have suffered terrible psychological repercussions from abortion. Having worked in nursing for over 40 years, I can tell you the repercussions will would blow your mind away because it, it damages them mentally and emotionally and spiritually the rest of their lives. Yes, thank you. We actually do have a healing program. It's Teshuva based and it's very effective. And yes, you're right. It's not told how women and and, their, and the men also suffer. It's um, In fact, when it comes to this saving the life of the mother, oftentimes more observant people say it's the mental health of a woman's having terrible mental problems. Abortion mm -hmm. is required, but it's very clear in the research that mental health problems get worse. Women are more suicidal after an abortion than they were before it. And women absolutely, that have- Absolutely, absolutely. Right. We need to educate our rabbis and our yep. doctors about this. They don't know. That's the thing. That's very important. Right now, now if Mashiach could come even one year earlier than, than the end of days, uh, again, the end of days being the end of days of evil, not the end of the world. Okay. So therefore, um, uh, that therefore, even one year earlier uh, from this year would have prevented October the 7th, right? So we have no idea how good it would be to bring Mashiach before uh, the, the absolute end of days. You know, so therefore, we should do what we can. And now, again, it's only because of the degradation in our generation. We have a new opportunity, uh, according to my, my uh, understanding. Uh, you know, it seems to me uh, that um, th this option to fight abortion can, can be the equivalent of um, other methods to bring Mashiach uh, sooner. So it's one thing to, for example, pray for Mashiach. It's another thing to do, be proactive to bring Mashiach and be proactive to bring Mashiach. What's greater than uh, uh, avoiding bloodshed? I mean, what's greater than that? Uh, we had another question. Comment? Uh, I did about the Shekhinah, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. What did you say? I said I did about the Shekhinah, if that's okay. What about the Shekhinah? So um, you had said something very interesting at the very beginning um, when I joined in. Uh, oh, about you the had interface? Yeah. You had cautioned people. The Shekhinah yeah. is not God. I've never heard anybody caution that before. And then it got me thinking, why would somebody say this? And so I started to research and I realized that it was connected to Yod K Vav K. And um, my question is this. Mm -hmm. So it's described as the fem feminine, which is really just to receive. And I was wondering, does this, I've never read anywhere where the Shekhinah rests upon a Gentile. And if that's the case, is that why only Jews could be in a minion? Like is is that's well, basically the question because that question will help me understand more. It's a good question because uh, what is Shechina? Now, again, there was a medrash that said that discusses the seven generations before Mount Sinai. Uh, each one brought the Shechina closer to Earth, and then it, it when it came to Earth, there was the revelation of Sinai. So it started with Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, each one bringing the Shekhinah closer. Um, so, so again, we're, we're talking about an interface where where the, it was ability to have the revelation at Sinai. Uh, and um, so we're, we're not talking about a, just a regular concept conception of holiness. It's not, like, you go to a holy place, you could feel holiness. Like, for example, it, uh, I was blessed to visit the... Um, the uh, burial site of uh, the matriarch Ra Rachel, Rachel Amen. So, if, if when I went into the house that, you know, the the 
it, it's not an actual mausoleum, but you know what I'm saying. The, the what do you call it? The, the building above a grave, uh, in, in by the graves of the great uh, righteous. So when I entered her building, um, I felt holiness. Um, I don't know if I ever felt holiness at that level. Uh, like when I entered into her building, it was. I and I also had a sensation like a, a feeling like I just came home or something. Like, like it was holiness and and being at home at the same time. So that, that was uh, extremely special. Now in, in the Temple Mount, I I don't go on the Temple Mount. You know, I follow the strict opinion to not go on the Temple Mount, even if you go to Mikvah uh, nowadays until yes. until uh, in, you know Mashiach and Eliyahu uh, come. But um, so I I I didn't. Go to a place of holiness like that um and and I, I was i was surprised you know so but that holiness the question is is that shekhinah it's it's hard to tell nowadays now since mount sinai the shekhinah is already on earth uh so it could have been shekhinah i but I, I i don't have anything to compare it with so i, I wouldn't know so i i i think maybe we should um take uh, save that question for elio and Avi. <laughs> so, uh, so, he has a more personal uh, experience with Shina, so. Maybe. Okay, ta -da, ta -da. Oh, no problem. Thanks. Good question. Um, so I, in answer, so I, I had a conversation. I've had conversations with different people with different backgrounds on online. So, in the course of speaking to one, sometimes you know the person may be a heretic or a missionary or something. So it, one one of these people was trying to um, use Shekhinah as a word to describe something other than really the God of Israel. Just like as a name towards a, a variation of a different religion's perspective of of, of, um, of an Israelite God, <laughs> but not the God of Israel, you know what I'm saying? So um, therefore, I just thought to mention that... Um, Shrina is 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 really an interface from our perspective, uh, because uh, remember God told Moses, "No one can see me and live." Mm -hmm. where, where Shrina, people can can be in the midst of Shrina and still survive. Right? We don't find that everybody puts on a veil before they talk to Shrina. Moses actually put on a veil after he talked to Shrina. It, therefore, it's it's not God, but no, the veil wasn't God. No, <laughs> right, right, no, but Shekhinah itself, if it was God and no one can see God and live, therefore Moses would wouldn't have been able to put on the veil because God forbid he would have died. You see, what I'm saying, therefore Shekhinah, mm -hmm. ergo Shekhinah is not God. Right. But, so, right. what is the definition for Shekhinah? Amen. It is the, the holiest, the holiest manifestation of God that we could have in, in this world, but it's really like, like somebody has a, um, uh, a video connection to, to God's world. Right. So that video screen, uh, we could see God's world even though we're not there. Right. So that's the closest we can get to God's world. So, right. it, when I, it's just a metaphor. I'm not saying Shrina is is a video screen. I'm saying it's it's the closest we could get to God's world without being destroyed. Right. So it's the holiness of God. As <laughs> this world can can right. withstand. Right. Mm -hmm. This world is built upon darkness, built mm -hmm. upon the capacity to not think about God. Mm -hmm. Whereas God is, his nature is, there's nothing else to think about. So therefore, Shekhinah is a way that it's it's only a humble God could could build build a shrina. It's it's a way for God to wait for us, you know, feminine form, passive wait for us to pursue spirituality, and be worthy of shrina. Rather than God overpower us with with His magnificence. Right. So, That's... so shrina is a sign of God's humility. Mm -hmm. it's amazing. Mm -hmm. it is but it's easy to understand that way if you can understand that it's the holiness mm -hmm. 
and it's not a physical person. Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, so, well, it's, you know, it's a chesed Hashem. I, I didn't expect to be able to teach this long. Uh, God is merciful to um, all of us. And uh, so uh, in later this month, it will be the last of the chemotherapies. And uh, then just the recovery process should be a couple more months. But uh, if this is an indication, it may be possible to have another kind of class like this um, in less than two months. I, I, I would have thought I would have to wait another two months. But uh, Well, you know so, what, Rabbi? Yeah. I think God has raised you up for this time to give this message. And maybe especially the one that is so really here at the end, meaningful of the shedding of, of the blood has a has tremendous amount of what's he doing now? What's what we're to expect, what's going on? And mm -hmm. being to explain it. If if it was explained to women what you how you explained it to us in God's view. It's so much more understanding. Wow. So it, that's very I kind of you to say. It needs to go forth. People need to understand it because if you don't understand it in that way, you can't, you don't believe it. Right. Oh, this, this uh, video should be going uh, to YouTube in the next, uh, how many hours? Uh, is it 24 hours, uh, Russell? When, when should it become live? No, it should be, it should be up here within an hour or so so it'll be it'll be not too long okay so we'll share we'll we'll share the link on facebook um and um and then uh just uh, share the link every, everywhere you can uh if, if this is yeah. and and when you share the link don't just share the link but say why you're sharing the link why you think this is this is an important message people should hear because right. again this the nature of this is that i haven't heard this from another rabbi I haven't read it from a holy book and that I was physically unable to give this class uh, three hours ago. Um, so God is doing something here. Uh, yes, he is. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Rabbi, you know, I was, I was uh, very involved with the um, pro-life movement, you know, during the nineties, you know, even at a national level and knew a lot of people and a lot of things. And, um, one of the things through the evangelical world, you know, this uh, pro-life evangelical world is they held the Jewish people uh, accountable uh, and blamed them for the abortion industry. And, um, you know, and I, I, I took their word at it. I didn't know anything. I didn't know any Jewish people or anything about Judaism at that point in time or Torah. So, uh, but once I got away and started uh, learning Torah and started uh, being introduced to rabbis and, and things, I found, you know, I was shocked to find out how pro-life, uh, uh, you know, that the Jewish people are and, and, and the Torah is and, that, and the, uh, the main theme of Torah is that it always chooses life. And um, and I felt uh, a, a really a deeper betrayal within the teachings that I was getting and hearing through the evangelical world on uh, Judaism and rabbis and the Torah and uh, you know concerning pro life. So I'm extremely happy to see these kind of messages coming out from a rabbi like you to give this message and to get and hopefully to reach. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. some of these this christian world uh, that, that understands that uh the jewish perspective of abortion and uh the mercy of hashem and the fact that you know torah always chooses life i think this is incredible to get out just from that perspective alone thank you sure. uh cecily any um any other comments also um I'm just sitting here so happy to listen to this conversation. <laughs> it's wonderful. I will definitely share this video and tell pe and ask people to share it so that it's multiplied over the World Wide Web. Um, and I will just say that in our work, I've met many evangelical Christians, and I feel that every time I meet one of them as a 
pro-life Jew, a little bit of that problem gets solved. You know, there's a little healing there. I don't think they want to harbor bad feelings towards us, but we have behaved badly, especially in public. And I think part of that has come from, there were many Jews that were involved with the beginnings of the National Abortion Rights Action League and getting abortion legalized in New York and then in the country. So we've had bad optics, but I'm trying, <laughs> the Jewish Pro-Life Foundation is trying to put a better face on things. And I think we're making a little progress, but I'm thrilled to hear that there's such a life affirming audience here and uh, in a merciful manner, because I always say God loves all of us, even those who don't agree with us. And rabbis taught me that people don't want to be they don't want to lack compassion. They want to be merciful and kind. So all we have to do is give them an opportunity to do that, and they will. I think I'll pass with that. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Rabbi. Thank you. Uh, Natanya, thank you. Natanya, you want to say something? I just said thank you. Oh, thank you for your thank you. Yeah. Uh, Linda, you want to say something? Just thank you. Oh, thank you for your thank you. Thank you. Be well. Hi, be well. <laughs> <laughs> Rufus Shlama, Rabbi, and let us know the good okay. news. Continue to let us know the good news. Okay, thank you very much. God bless. Well,